All right, welcome back to today's chapter. Uh, we got chapter six we're going to do today, chapter seven tomorrow, and then obviously test one uh, in the online section. Uh, chapter six we are going to go over today is title work. Title work in, is a very confusing concept uh, because a lot of people misunderstand what title is. They confuse it with the deed or they're used to seeing their title on their automobile, which is completely different than we have. Title is this etherical idea. No one in the world has ever seen title. It's like an idea. When I say, hey, I've got an idea, I can't show you my idea. I can show you the wheel that came from my idea and I can show you the title insurance policy, but I can't show title. And if you think about that video game that I always talk about, uh, Zelda, where they boop, they bump into each other and the diamond transfers from one person to the other. This is virtually what we're talking about today is this transfer boop, or conveyance of ownership to from the seller to the buyer, all right? So title actually represents two things. It represents the right to sell the property and it represents uh, evidence that you actually own the property. So unlike a car where you say, oh, I got the title work, we don't see title, okay? We see the concept or understand the concept of it. And when we transfer title or convey it, we do it either voluntarily while we're alive, or if we do it in a will, that would still consider voluntarily because you wrote the will while you were alive. We also can do it involuntarily where it's done to us. And we will talk about both of these today, both the voluntary and the involuntary alienation. All right, so there on the first page, on page 84, we're gonna talk about voluntary alienation. This is where you are choosing to surrender your real property for some reason. Either you're gonna give it away, you're gonna sell it, you're gonna will it, you're gonna lease it, some manner, but it is in fact voluntary that you are going to do it. Now, remember we have talked about the OR and the EE, and I told you that was the attorney's way of making uh, their job important. We can't use the words buyer and seller, no. We use the words grantor, that's the guy doing the action. We probably call that the seller. And then there's this grantee. That would be the buyer in this situation, all right? So we are going to talk about the voluntary alienation or the conveyance of a uh, real property from the grantor to the grantee. Now, we can't see title, so we use this legal piece of paper called a deed. Remember I told you back in uh, chapter one or two, it was called the bundle of rights and they were called the twigs. And I said that comes from the old English version of when the person would break a branch off their tree and they would pass it as a symbolic gesture to the buyer who would take the twig. And that was their method of conveying property. We still use that same concept to this day, only we now use this thing called a deed, all right? It is our symbolic gesture of voluntarily alienating ourselves from one person to the other. Now, a deed is a contract. It is a legal binding contract that transfers the word title from one person to the other. And because it is a contract, it must follow all of the stipulations that a contract does. Now, I know we haven't got to contracts yet, so just realize that it's gotta have a legal purpose. It's gotta be by competent parties. It's a promise to do something. There's some consideration. 
All of these things are involved. So starting over there on page 85, we can look at all of the requirements that a deed must have to be valid. All right, so the first deed or the first section is, let's talk about the competent parties. There is a grantor who is a seller who must be of legal age and sufficient mental capacity to understand what he's doing. And I've told you before, we had a deal back in February of this year where the seller actually came in to the closing hammered beyond belief, all right? And the title company actually refused to close the deal. They said, hey, you may not be in a competent state of mind. We are not going to take a chance that down the road you go, oh, I was drunk or something. So they said, just come back tomorrow and we'll do it. Of course, the buyers were way pissed off. Um, but unfortunately, the title company who runs the closing was at their discretion. They just said, no, we're not closing it. Now, there are many, many court cases where they have revealed the fact that if you are voluntarily incapacitated, like drunk, high, things like that, there have been plenty of court cases where the judge has said, you can't use that as an excuse to shirk your duties in a contract but there still have been litigations that involve that, okay? So <clears throat> they probably could have got away with it, but uh, the title company just said, hey, we're not doing it. So the grantor has to be of sufficient mental capacity, has to be of legal age to transfer the property. He will then transfer the property to the grantee. The grantee is the buyer. The buyer, believe it or not, doesn't sign the deed, but they have to be identified on the deed. And they have to be identified in such a manner that they can be separated from the rest of the population. You cannot deed your property to your best buddy, Bob. That would not classify as a legal uh, grantee, you would have to name him Robert J. Faudre the third, so that he could be identified, and you would not know who that is. I can't do it to my favorite cousin or my friendly neighbor. You have to name them in such a manner that they can be identified. If there are multiple people, then you name them both: Bob and Sue Smith. Typically, it would be Bob Smith and Sue Smith as joint tenants or as husband and wife so that it would identify all of the people that would be taking the property. Now, this contract we've talked about has to have consideration, has to have something of value. In the marriage contract, you can see if your pastor said, ever called it the marriage contract, you're going to see that that runs parallel to a contract, it, it is a legal contract. And in the marriage contract, there is consideration. There is love, honor, and cherish. That has value between the husband and the wife. In real estate, we practice this thing called an arm's length transaction, meaning I don't know you, you don't know me, therefore, honor, love, cherish, respect, really has no value to us. I don't care if Ross likes me or loves me. When he transfers the property, I'll probably never see him again. So therefore it has no value. In real estate, the only thing that we have that has value is money, all right? We want the cheddar, the jack, the cheese. I don't know, that's about the extent of my street lingo. You young people, do you still use cheddar? Is that still a word? You're all looking at me like I got three horns. This dude's old. They don't use cheddar anymore? Okay. So it's got to have money. Matter of fact, it is so important that it has money that in the deed, there is a very specific clause that states for $10 and other good and valuable services. 
So if in fact you give your property to somebody, the deed still has a nominal value of $10 so that the contract is a legitimate contract because it has to have something of value. So even giving your property away technically still has a value of $10 so that the contract can be legal and enforceable when you give it to that person, all right? Now that next section there is called the granting clause. This is the clause that grants the property in some fashion from the buyer or the seller. And the granting clause is the cousin to who? Santa Claus. Come on, that was obvious. That was right there. You guys should have seen that one coming. The granting clause, and there are four granting clauses that we would use. They are very verbiage specific, meaning when it says this, it means this. So let's go over these four so we can explain what that uh, grantor is actually granting. In that bullet point there, it says, I, Raymond Modulin, convey and warrant. In your book, write the word general warranty deed. It is a general warranty deed. This is the highest form, the biggest mama Luca, the one everybody wants, all right? Matter of fact, it is already pre-printed in our purchase agreement. It says the property will be transferred by general warranty deed or, and then there's a blank that somebody could write in if they wanted something different. 